I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you all to this Inside Scoop webinar where we're going to be talking all things related to our upcoming open call script submission window. Um, as you all have noticed, we'll be recording this webinar and we'll make it available a bit later in case anyone wants to uh, share it with their writer friends or have a, a quick recap themselves. We've got closed captioning available for those who would like to make use of it. You just have to click on the uh, CC button at the bottom of your screens there. So we've got about an hour today to cover quite a bit of ground. So I'll keep my rambling to a minimum. I'm quite a rambler, so I'll have to fight my own instinct to, to just shut up and let other people speak. We've got four brilliant guests who I'm going to introduce you to shortly uh, and we'll leave a bit of time towards the end of the session um, for Q&A so if you do have any questions please save them up till a little bit later in the conversation so you can see what ground's covered and then pop them in the designated Q&A box and we'll get round to answering as many of those as we can in the time that we have available towards the end of the session. Um, last year, we ran some regular Zoom drop-in sessions during the application window, and they were an awful lot of fun. Um, I don't know if the writers thought they were fun, but we did. We got some good feedback, actually, from those writers who did join us. So we're going to be doing those again this year. There's five planned throughout the open call um, application window, and the first will take place next week. So details of all those dates, how to join, how to get involved are available on the website now. So if you have a question here that we're unable to get to in the time that we have today, then do please consider joining one of those drop-ins and having a chat with us directly about it. And they are fun, I promise. They're, they are good fun and a nice way to meet some other writers as well, actually, and some of the writers room team. Um, okay, so that's enough rambling on from me for the time being at least uh, i'd like to introduce you to our four brilliant guests we have uh writers daniel rusto george Afonso, amy trigg uh they're all alumni of bbc writers room program so they should have lots of insight about how what it's really like for writers on our writer programs and we're also joined by the wonderful nigel hastings who is our reader development producer and senior representative of the reading team here today so um i'm gonna ask the writers to just introduce themselves really briefly just maybe tell us what writers room programs you've been a part of and uh, a quick recap of your writing careers to date um, so if I can start with, I'll start with Amy, if that's okay. Yes, hello, I'm Amy. Um, always first, uh, the curse of the A name. Uh, yeah, I'm an actor and writer from Essex, and um, I got into writing a few years ago with a play, so I can come from a theatre background, um, uh, which I'm currently on tour with, so if you want to come and watch, please come. Always on it. Um, and I've done uh, the Writers Access Group Drama Room, and I'm currently on TV Drama Writers Programme, and I am yeah currently writing for various projects uh, for TV, and I've done a bit of radio as well, and doing stage. Brilliant. Thanks, Amy. Um, Daniel. Hello. Hi, Daniel. Um, um, I did all three. So London Voices, um, Drama Room, and the TV Drama development program i think yeah. it's called and completed uh, writer's room daniel you've I done completed it, it. yeah <laughs> i saved the princess <laughs> um, yes um so yeah i did those and um i'm a writer i write for the stage screen and i'm also flirting with like um prose as well and um written for hollyoaks and working both in the uk and in the us um via zoom but may be moving around i got us management back in 2020 so they were doing a lot of us rooms via zoom so i've done a couple of those as well um and uh yeah got a bunch of things in development here and over there brilliant thank you and georgia um yeah i ha did northern voices um and i um, just finishing a uh, BBC drama room. Um, we are about to have our meeting with um, Indies um, in the next few weeks. So that's really exciting. Um, and sort of similar to these guys, I started out in um, theatre, um, did a drama degree in 
at uni of manchester and did playwriting as kind of my specialism and then um carried on making theatre with my best mate sarah in our theatre company and plays that i wrote through that got me into bbc writers room um, and at the moment i am uh, working as a theatre maker um running workshops and about to send off my spec that I've just written with Drama Room into the world. So hopefully that will be leading something <laughs> next year. Well, that's exciting. That's brilliant. Thanks, Georgia. And Nigel, last but by no means least, can you tell us a little bit about your role? Yeah, uh, well, I'm a freelance producer um, and consultant, script editor and reader. Um, I've been associated with Writers' Room for a long, long, long time. Started out as a reader, still read for them, because I think that's the bottom line. Everyone has to be keep their reading sharp. Um, I've done a variety of different roles for Writers' Room, including running Open Call, and before that it was Script Room, Comedy and Drama, um, the TV Drama Writers' Programme, uh, and then for other parts of the BBC, including the World Service International Radio Playwriting Competition, which I'm, we're about to start again. I've run that a couple of times now. And I did the inaugural Gortman Simpson. And I also write, because I'm freelance, I work for a variety of other, um, other organisations. Thanks, Nigel. So I'll give you, I'm going to move on and just chat a bit about Open Call, how it works, what we're looking for, and the different groups that we um, select for. And then um, we can have a chat with Nigel about how the reading process works and the reading team a bit. So um, I'm sure that everybody who's tuned in today, if you found this webinar, you, you, you know something about Open Call. It's our big annual script submission window. Um, we're going to be opening uh, this year's call out next week on Wednesday, 9th of November, closing it on Wednesday, the 7th of December. So it's slightly earlier than in previous years. Um, but it does mean that writers will have a Christmas without having to worry about finishing off a draft. You should have it done, dusted, submitted before uh, the holidays. Um, we use Open Call as a means of selecting participants for both our Drama Room Writer Development Programme and also our UK wide uh, voices groups. So, all in all, we hope um, to be able to select up to 100 writers from across the length and breadth of the UK through the Open Call alone. Um, you can find more information about Drama Room and the Voices groups on our website. Um, there's some personal blogs on there from writers who've been through the programmes recently, um, and also info about the sorts of topics, speakers, conversations that we have within those groups. Um, it's important to say that at Writers Room, we're looking for writers to develop rather than projects to commission or to produce. So that's always at the front of our minds. We're looking for writers um, with an emerging voice identifiable through um, their writing, who've done some work thinking about the types of stories they want to tell, uh, as well as the type of writer they want to be, which is uh, really important as well. We're looking for fresh perspectives, compelling characters and relationships, intriguing worlds, problems, situations, and always authentic characterful dialogue as well. Um, in most cases, writers who are successful in getting into one of our writer programmes have usually been applying to Open Call for a few years, and they've used it as a way maybe to keep themselves producing work regularly and measuring their progress. Um, so I'm going to have a chat now with Nigel, who's our brilliant reader development producer, senior member of the reading team. So, Nigel, a few questions for you um, to, to start with. Uh, we get asked a lot about the readers, who they are, what their experience is. Can you can you give us a bit of insight into who the reading team are and what they're all about? Yes, of course. Without giving any names away, they they are anonymous for their um, uh, for their own good. Really, uh, it's a very experienced and diverse team uh, of writers, theatre and TV writers, producers, script editors. Um, they're certainly not entry level. Uh, I think there's been a call out recently, and the um, one, one of the things, one of the main things was everyone had to have at least three years um, experience. The current team, which we're refreshing, has even more. Um, there's a BBC radio producer as well in the mix. Um, there's a theatre director and dramaturg. Uh, there's a filmmaker and university lecturer with a PhD in film. So that, that kind of 
It's a very interesting and diverse mix. Um, they all have professionally produced credits, including writing and producing for BBC, Sky, BFI, various independents, the National Theatre, the RSC. Uh, it's actually the breadth of their knowledge and experiences actually makes the meetings quite intimidating for people like me because um, I kind of think, oh, well, I can't really tell you how to do them, <laughs> how you should be doing. Um, it's very collaborative um, and they're very ex invested and excited by the process. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, people have said we, we, we one uh, re reader who, who was with us for about five years and has recently left because they've just got too busy with writing commissions, said it helped her writing journey so much, reading other people's scripts, talking about them. And, um, and she still sort of pops back and writes blogs and stuff for us because um, she feels very kind of attached to the whole process. Is that yeah. concise? Yeah, no, that's brilliant. And th they are, they're an incredibly smart bunch of people, aren't they? They are yes. an intimidating collective um, when it comes to sort of talking about stories and scripts and they've got so much experience. And it's, it's really important and valuable to us that they do come from that range of backgrounds as well. Because of course we're expect accepting scripts from radio dramas and plays and TV, film, you know, a full like range of, of scripts. So it is really important that the And readers... actually, can I, I'll just add to that, Jess. Yeah. Jess the, um, quite often um, a reader will go, do you know what? There's something here in this script, but this isn't quite my game. So, because they might be more theatre based, can you get someone else to look at it? And that's part of the whole process is moving this stuff around to make sure everyone gets as, as kind of fair a, a, a look at the script as possible. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. That's, and you know, that sort of thing shows it's it's really working when that's happening, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. Um, and the other thing we get asked a lot about is that initial 10 page read and what the readers are looking for in that, um, that really competitive first sift stage. Can you fill us in on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, it's a funny one, isn't it? it must be, I mean, I, I do feel sorry for writers who, you know, have been laboring over their 60 to 90 pages, and then we only read 10 pages. But at the same time, um, it's kind of, it's how people watch TV. Mm -hmm. it's, it's so competitive, people watch TV. And we'll, I mean, my son, he's 80, he'll, he'll watch four or five minutes and go, nah, not gonna watch that. Um, uh, and so, and also f I was reading at the weekend, film festivals only watch the, the first five minutes sometimes. And because you submit on Vimeo, you can tell how much time they've watched, which is really interesting. Um, I think it's important to say it's not literally 10 pages. I always encourage the readers to kind of read a bit more if they're interested. Um, so it's, you know, it's pretty, they probably read probably 10 to 15. Um, I think you can tell a lot from the first 10 pages. You can tell a massive amount. Um, the In a nutshell, because there's not much time, but I would say, think about the purpose of your 10 pages as being to concisely introduce us to intriguing characters in an interesting and believable world and give them a problem that needs to be solved or a dilemma they face or a difficult goal. So if you can do those three things, character, world and problem, you should have a good opening. Um, examples would be the opening of time. Uh, I think the script is actually on the Writers' Room website. Yeah, it it's, a, I mean, you, in, in four pages, I was having a look at it uh, yesterday in preparation for this, in four pages, you, you're hooked, but also you immediately know who the main character is, you know what the situation is, you know what his dilemma is, because he's new, he's never been in prison, but he's surrounded by these much younger people who obviously are very experienced of the system, by, by a guy of who's equal age, who's, who's like a, an experienced, um, uh, warden and it, in four pages it does all this and mm. what the thing that Jess mentioned earlier really characterful dialogue so it immediately grabs your attention um, another few examples a completely different example would be vigil which opens in complete silence but with that with the Scottish trawler just being sucked into the ocean that is just extraordinary um, uh, killing Eve which I think I, this time last year I mentioned so I won't go on about that but have have a look at that the first 10 minutes of that. Um, all of these things, uh, I'm not sure. Oh yeah, I think Time, Vigil, uh, Killing Eve are all on the, on the uh, script library and you can actually watch them on iPlayer. So mm -hmm. have a look at them. Happy Valley is another absolute classic, brilliant beginning as well. Um, I 
yeah, yeah. So that's that that's enough? great advice i think that's brilliant advice yeah just um read lots and see how yeah. experienced writers do it watch lots um i always when i'm in the cinema i always like check my watch when you get like the big dramatic inciting incident it's usually always within sort of 10 to 15 exactly. minutes as well which is really really fascinating i was watching um i was telling you guys i was watching smile and yeah bang on 12 minutes you know big exciting i won't spoil it thing happens um but yeah absolutely do you do a bit of homework treat it a little bit like homework isn't it do the reading yeah. look at those scripts and um, don't worry about setup you know don't worry about we're all so cine literate especially post covid we've all watched so much you yeah. don't if you trust that the audience has intelligence and that we will we'll be on it especially yeah. you, you have the you that first 10 minutes you have the the concentration of the audience or the concentration of the reader and i always say when i'm when i'm talking to readers we're the first audience for these scripts so yeah. see it like that and see if that this is working for you um hit the hit hook, hook attention immediately hit the ground running and that doesn't mean you have to have an explosion or a sinking trawler that might be just by the beginning of the virtues um the main character you just see him looking so glum watching out of the van window and you immediately think gosh what, what's what's happened to him i want to know and then they sort of drive through the town and you get so you get re, so he introduces the world introduces the main character and introduces the idea has this guy has a problem in a 40 second shot without any dialogue yeah i mean we're curious nosy creatures aren't we if absolutely you keep asking people why what happens next then i think you're onto something aren't you? well that's a very good thing because readers readers often say to me i actually wanted to read on when they're recommending a script they said i only had 10 pages i wanted to read on and then lo later in the process they'll go what happened to that one i was reading yeah they do you know like, they get oh, yeah, invested they in yeah them. yeah was it was it still good at 30 pages was it yeah yeah it, it is an interesting process and then just in terms of like the script overall so the the, the scripts that tend to get a bit further through the process. Um, what, what is it that makes those stand out? What are the readers looking for? Well, I guess it's Tom Lazenby, who was the drama commissioner for a while, head of commissioning, wasn't he? He used to say, look out for what makes you lean forward, mm -hmm. which I thought was really interesting way of putting it. So it's like an active leaning, you want to kind of leaning forward, go, oh, what's going to happen next? Or who are these people? Or what is this world? So mm -hmm. it's kind of what you said, Jess, I think it's voice. Yeah. yeah. Obviously, um, uh, characters, brilliant, memorable characters, a distinctive voice and take on the world, um, surprising relationships and messed up things, because that's, you know, as you say, we're curious, nosy people. Um, we want to see those things. Uh, you know, it's like gossiping with your next, you hear what happened up the road. You, yeah. you, you know them. We want to, we want to actually see what's happening. Um, good, bold, ambitious stories about, you know, things that surprise us. Uh, really interesting settings that we might not have seen before. And that doesn't mean, you know, it has to be set on Mars, although I'd love to read a story set on Mars. You know, there was a, there was a script, I think not last year, the year before, that was set on a Newcastle Metro and it was just two people chatting. But that was, a, you know, they, was, they, were, they were so interesting characters, but it was brilliant, um, uh, uh, you know, a world we hadn't seen, really, insight into a world we hadn't seen. Um, relevance is really important as well. So it's about every, I think it was, um, I can't remember, it was one of, one of the Greek philosophers who said, plays are about how we live. And I think that's a really important thing. If it uh -huh. reflects how we live as human beings, whatever world we're in, um, or whatever, yeah, whatever class, whatever, wherever we are, it's always about how we live. And for me also, I think most things um, are about family whether it's constructed family or real family, it's about family relationship, because that's our universal experience. So even a sort of high concept detective thing like Giri Hadji, which was in Japan and so was still about family as much as Gavin and Stacey say. Yeah, that's absolutely true, isn't it? Things that um, on space stations are about family as well, aren't they? You know, yeah. yeah. Oh, done. Would, yeah, sorry, can I quick, like, let's say you are, at that point and you have this how would someone because when you're in the script you don't know if it's a lean forward script or a lean forward idea if you're what how would what advice would you give to a writer that wants to test that before submitting before even writing those 60 pages ah really good point i would say write from the heart write what you want to write about what interests you what makes you angry or sad or happy 
um, rather than, and they were often, and it's entirely understandable because uh, we're all fl flawed humans. You often see scripts that try to be what they think we are looking for or what they've seen because it's especially with you know things like uh, procedurals with what they see on telly they go oh I, I can write something like that what's far more interesting is writing what you care about because then your personal view will come out and your voice will come out does that does that help do you think that's the lean the lean forward thing is a world we haven't seen or or an angle on on something we haven't seen or you know I mean I was a big and I was a big fan of Giri Hedgy because it was a really interesting take on the procedure. Um, mm. Similarly, Dublin murders. So there was a sort of personal take on it or even, or say Killing Eve, all quite high concept things. But, um, you know, it, it was those characters and those worlds we hadn't seen that were really interesting. And also the, the kind of difference between the world that Eve was from and the world that the assassin was from, you know, that, that kind of con contrast. Um, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't think you can go, I'm going to write something that makes you lean forward. I think if you write from the heart about what you really want to say about the world and your place in it and, you know, what, your experience of it, that will make us lean forward. Mm. Is that, is that, does that help, Daniel? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I just remember, like, myself, you know, you have this pilot you spent months on and to you it's the most interesting, unique perspective and story but then you realize it's it's an amalgamation of your three favorite shows from the last decade and uh i find what helps especially is if i have an idea just talk to a friend about it or talk to or talk to a relative who doesn't even watch those type of shows you like you know and just see if those first few sentences make them go and then what you know yeah i think you're absolutely right i mean i think um you know who was i reading the, the martin madonna i think i was reading an interview with and he said he wrote eight plays before he got one that he thought was any good mm. um so it's, it's keeping writing isn't it as writers uh georgia amy don't you think you just got to keep going yeah and you've got to write i think beyond your influences and references because i think at the beginning you start with imitation you're writing the show you're writing versions of the stuff that you love um it's only when you sort of push beyond that and keep and that's just time that's just putting in your ten thousand hours or whatever it is they say you need to do before you're expert at something yeah i think just keep asking like if if yeah i think it's great advice to sort of share ideas with friends who are just consumers of stories and if they if they do want to know what happens next then i think you're onto something aren't you that's the lean forward moment, isn't it? Is that yeah? And then what happens? And then it's, what? It's, happens? A, it's a really yeah. go on, Amy. Go on, sorry, sorry. I was just going to say, I'll shut up. Um, just to like throw in there that I think sometimes there's a pressure to like reinvent the wheel and find like the newest thing. But just to remind you, we all love the Lion King, and um, well, it was stolen, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> so I think it's also it's so important about your voice. Like it's not about creating something new; it's about putting your own twist on it. Exactly. Absolutely. That's exactly yeah. right. And it's hard. It's hard asking people to look at your work, obviously. But even when I'm editing, it's kind of it's that horrible moment. You give it to the producers and they and you can't and all you want, you become eight year, years old again. All you want is the gold star and you're never going to get it. <laughs> you know, you're only ever going to get see me. But well, those conversations will will um, will help improve or or you might dismiss them. You know, you might show your script to someone and they might go, oh, well, I didn't get this, I didn't. And you might go, well, okay, but that's just your opinion. Yeah. Because uh, no one knows anything. That, that William Goldman thing, I, I say every meeting I, I start with, with a new writer or with a new reader, I say, look, no one knows anything. This is just my opinion. If I did know, if, you know, if, if there was a magic wand, then we wouldn't be kind of puzzling about it. There's no, there's, you know, do, do, you know, do you see what I'm saying? Uh, you know, like Queen's Gambit took 30 years to be, to be recognized. 30 years and then it was a huge hit so that's absolute yeah. proof that no one knows anything yeah and, and sometimes make... like the the right time still needs to come for some stories as well um yeah i think it's you maybe you're just a bit ahead of your time as well sort of pitching ideas yeah. that we're not ready for yet maybe maybe that's um yeah like the favorite that's another story of a of a script that was in development for a long time and then it's moment just arrived i also though get the sense that as if you are submitting it's it's not necessarily the idea that's going to get you through so no. you know so that's yeah. important but also you, you don't want to 
you don't wanna, you don't want writers to be too focused on something that's so unique and amazing that it's going to be the idea that busts them through. It's more, I'm, I think it sounds as well about the the craft and the quality of the writing. Yes, that's exactly yeah. right. That's what Jess was saying. It's writers, not projects, is the bottom right, yeah. line always. So it's the writing, not the idea. And so it's yeah. you know your approach to whatever yeah. you're writing about. Because I'd get scared off and think, oh no, I've seen a version of that, and then I I would just take so long to finally start, not realizing that the idea that I was really passionate about, even though it had a little similarity here, there's only seven stories apparently they say anyway, so there's gonna be yeah. you know, a version. Yeah. in some version even the title might be the same I remember when the bodyguard came out and I was like what you can do that I didn't know you could just <laughs> there was this movie called the Body... oh, anyway but yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. um it's yeah. it's yeah it's the I think it sounds like the readers are also looking at the voice that's coming through more so than even just how unique that idea is that is 100% that's... what it is yeah. it is the voice it is voice the thing. Oh, it's really voice. interesting I've sat in so many meetings with with kind of commissioners or with or with um funders and, you know, there would be like a, a general meeting for a writer, which is never really a general meeting. It's because they're interested. And they, and you must have had this experience. They, they, is, they go, so, so what are you working on at the moment? OK. And then what else? And then what else have you got? And it usually comes to the third and fourth one. And the writer always looks a bit bashful and kind of goes, oh, well, is this kind of funny idea? I was thinking about this. And that's the one they leap on. That's the lean forward moment. They go, ah, oh, that. But everyone's a bit ashamed because it's their most personal story. Yeah, it's a bit vulnerable. Yeah, so it's it. a bit, oh, yeah. I feel a bit embarrassed about this one. Yeah. And nine times out of ten, that's the one they go for. It's really interesting. And so saying, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's voice. It's, it's for you. It's your perspective, your take on the world. So just final question for you, Nigel. Any top tips for writers who are considering submitting to the window coming well, I think up? we've kind of covered them. I think we kind of have, the, yeah. I think we've exhausted really? <laughs> Um, I don't know. Just be bold. You, you might, you probably never will have the chance again to write exactly what you want. You'll always have someone, you know, like Jess breathing. No, you'll always have, a, <laughs> you'll always have a commissioner or an editor or a script doctor or this or a that, a producer breathing down your neck going, yeah, can you change this bit? And you, you, so yeah, just, just See it as a brilliant opportunity to write whatever you want that you really care about and you want to say. Great advice. Thanks, Nigel. That's all right. Um, so quite some questions now for the writers. Uh, if we start with you, Amy, you are on both Drama Room and Writers Access Group and TV Drama Writers Programme. Um, were there any sessions in particular that really helped develop your skills and prepare you for the industry? Yeah, I mean, a lot. I, the ones that spring to mind, uh, the John York session, which was quite a long session where we explored his book uh, Into the Woods, which just felt like a really nerdy book club. Um, and it was great to kind of take all those uh, things from the book and put them into practice and, uh, you know, get to ask him questions and clarify things. Uh, that was great. That kind of brought out the nerd in me. And they're the ones that I think I refer to those notes quite a lot. I have my notebooks here from my two got my drama room book and my writer's access group and they were like <laughs> bibles for me especially in the first few months afterwards like referring back to notes and yeah I go to that session a lot also the audio drama session was really great because I wasn't sure I was too interested in audio drama but I went along because I thought you know make the most of what we're being offered and um Kirsty Williams was one of the people leading the session uh, who's a producer for radio and um, it was great and then a few months later there was an opportunity that came through for radio through writer's room and um, I applied and got it and I ended up working with Kirsty and it was so great to have that kind of shortcut of referring to things that we spoke about in the session um, which just goes to show to just make the most of everything handed to you and then other ones was pitching like one page pitch session I think or pitches we did with Philip Shelley was great and then the speed dating at the end on zoom with all the um indies was <laughs> mildly like overwhelming but in a really great way to just meet so many people what a great opportunity might need to explain what that is a bit more <laughs> yeah yeah speed dating, <laughs> speed dating. Yeah. yeah maybe contextualize that a little bit amy yeah i think so uh, but yeah so we uh, we met with at the end because our session was uh our uh, drama room was all on zoom uh, so at the end of it we met with uh, loads of 
indies uh, like production companies and we had like five to ten minutes with each of them in a zoom room before we got booted out of that zoom room and went and met the next one so it was literally like speed dating all these people I think we got partnered up we had a buddy with us from our group so that was quite nice and it was a really nice introduction to what generals will be like when you start getting generals um yeah so that was great just to meet so many people and I got generals off of the back of that session um which is always positive Oh, so they opened a door for fuller meetings later down the line. Yeah, we we went on a first proper date. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I feel like there's a reality TV format in this. <laughs> anyway, uh, thanks, Amy. Uh, Daniel, so how did progressing from voices to drama room and then TV drama writers program impact your development as a writer? Did did the sort of progression through the different initiatives help build your confidence and that kind of thing yeah definitely that's the main aspect of it was the confidence build with every every new session and I mean, and I'm always writing at the same time so you're kind of like taking on those tools you know you don't have to write a whole new script like I always advise just you know, write a little short or a half hour or a mm -hmm. scene and so I'm always like trying to take on those new little skills that we're giving there were some really good sessions um that really helped with that. So I practiced that way. And I definitely felt with every time I returned, I felt more like a writer. And then I want, at some point, you just end up calling yourself a writer, isn't it? That's the moment, isn't it? When someone asks. Mm. Um, when did that and, happen for you? What 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 was that point? Uh, it was between voices, I think, and uh, drama room. Yeah. Yeah. Was it between then? Funny enough, yeah, like I wasn't confidently saying it yet. And I'd, I'd had professional work, you know, and that interestingly, you, I, I think I assume that once you start getting paid, you'll confidently refer to yourself as one, but you still kind of feel like a, or I still felt like a bit of an imposter at first. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, yeah, every, yeah, every session, you feel it growing like the confidence inside as you attend each one because you learn you take on so much you can go away and it process it later and use the tools yeah oh brilliant that's that's great to hear and it's I think yeah it's the imposter syndrome is the hardest thing to shake off isn't it I think for everybody in every walk of life mm. <laughs> everything that any any career you're in I think you talk to the most people and people still have that sense of self-doubt and yeah anxiety mm. Uh, yeah even even now if I've got to like start a pilot I'm still like how do I do this again and you have to like get the groove going and then question yourself so I don't know for me it hasn't actually ever gone I'm just able to use certain tricks that I've learned from funny enough from the different schemes yeah. So, yeah that you can kind of like silence that voice and come up with your tricks on how you can get into the flow of work yeah um, yeah find your flow state yes exactly. yeah <laughs> And Georgia, so um, have you, you've, you've been in a couple of different programs, met lots of different writers through those. Have you stayed in touch with those cohorts and how, how helpful is it to have that sort of network of peers? Oh, I mean, it's so helpful. I think, um, yeah, I have kept in touch with Northern Voices. We were, um, we just finished up just before COVID hit. So that was a little tricky because we were so stoked to like be meeting up all the time. And then obviously that couldn't happen, but it's still on Twitter and things like that. It's so great to see people, um, you know, moving forward, getting pilots, getting commissioned. And, you know, whenever you see someone like that, who you've met, you feel like Tony um, was on my Northern Voices cohort um, who wrote the responder so that was pretty inspiring <laughs> um, and then um, with Drama Room we've had like a WhatsApp going I hope it never goes away the whole way through the process and you know everyone's just so encouraging of each other there's no kind of competition I feel it's very um, and people spot like people are really bad at bigging up themselves but people will spot like oh Ros has got a thing on at the Soho or like we'll like be shouting about it for each other and and really excited and I find that you know you just feel it's like a lovely writery family where you can also kind of scream into the void when you've got a deadline <laughs> yeah you can all support each other and share 
knowledge and information and industry knowledge and information as well I think that's really helpful isn't it and celebrate each other's successes yeah because writers are, are shy retiring people who don't shout enough about their successes so it's yeah it's helpful to have that that peer network and I think every group has a has a whatsapp group don't they it seems everybody yeah has a has a big group whatsapp where they can chat away to each other and celebrate and commiserate um so I think most of you started out in theatre that's right isn't it like we all sort of got your first got started writing for theatre um how did you find making that transition from writing plays to starting to think about tv specs was it challenging did did the the writers programs help demystify that or not you can say if they, if they didn't <laughs> um well I'll start with Amy again sorry Amy it's the curse of the A it's all right um, yeah and I mean for me I think personally the biggest difference was I yeah in TV there are so many people involved in making a script like everyone you get notes constantly and uh, even down the line when you're like oh this is perfect then a commissioner comes along blooming commissioners uh, <laughs> they're like here's another set of notes um and and it, which is great in a way and that's something actually that I really enjoy which I didn't think I would I thought the structure would scare me off of tv a little bit but it's actually something that I really uh grab onto now and I've taken into theatre writing um I think with tv the thing that I learned is that there are more rules to learn even if you're going to break them later on it's mm -hmm. really beneficial to learn them and that's what these schemes helped me demystify mm -hmm. Daniel how did you how did you find that move um, so I, I started writing both at the same time, but like okay. I was putting on stage stuff for myself. But um, yeah, so but doing even schemes in TV or theatre, they they complement each other. So things I've learned from theatre definitely helped my TV, and things I learned from TV help theatre. As an example, um, you know, especially when you join a room or another job, they you know every scene's pretty thought out, you know beat by beat where you're going before you go to script and I kind of like that um mm -hmm. that pre preparation before going to script which I use in my theater I have like 75 percent of the story beat right. out before I start the play and that's from tv theater I love that you can have two characters talk for hours about lunch you know and you know <laughs> they're talking about breaking up <laughs> yeah I love that sort of stuff from theater that I you, I've tried to put more into television. So it's, it's tools like that that I put. And so I, I, it's fun in that way for them to like inform each other and- uh, yeah. So it's a bit know. of cross fertilization going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. Processes. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I think that's interesting that you've taken that sort of staying in the sort of beat sheet or the prose document for a bit longer before taking it to draft in theater work as well. Yeah, um, yeah. But you're still, you know, when you're in the page, you're still being free to let wherever your I'm embarrassing myself, wherever your creative muse lets you go. I don't know why yeah. I hesitated yeah, there. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. um because once you're in the pages, I don't know, you just find there might be a way your character comes to life more and wants to go left instead of right. And so you're still being open to that, but I just feel safer when I know that my story is kind of prepped and that could take a week or a month or six months. Mm -hmm. um before going into the pages and then just being open to wherever it might go when, when I do start and then with the redraft as well because you could finish your first draft and then come back to it and just be like oh that's not working I want to go the other way now always just being open to like your own critiques as well as others but not taking all those critiques of others because that could also mean that's just what they would do but then sometimes it's a it's a great pitch and a great idea and you gotta like just suck it up yeah, but you got to stay true to your own intention as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Jack Thorne said that he never used to plan anything. And then the busier he got, the more he realized that that was the efficient way to do it, mm. um, to, to plan it ahead rather than sort of wait for inspiration. Or you know, So that's really interesting, Dan, you should say that. Mm. Yeah. And like I've done these American jobs and they've got like every scene is planned. Like there's a paragraph for every single scene that you've gone over together as a room. And then they say, okay, here you go now, write your script. So there's no surprises when that script is returned to them a week later, sometimes, or maybe less or a bit longer. Um, 
So there's no surprises, but then there's still more, there's more drafting to do within that. But um, isn't that amazing? Like every single scene, like from the teaser to the next scene, to walking on the street, to when they, like every single thing is is planned. And um, you don't have to do that all the way. So I like to do a version of that, mm-hmm. but um, it's, it's a very detailed process. Yeah, some of those documents can be longer than the scripts as well. Yeah. It? it was American. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. And Georgia, you got anything to to add? Um, I mean, I totally agree about the planning. I think that's something that I've really started to build into how I write, which I never used to do. I just was like, Plah! like, and just see <laughs> anything like came out. Um, but um, it is more efficient. <laughs> I have to tell myself that because I don't like doing the planning, but it is more efficient. Um, and I think it was just kind of like becoming more expansive with my ideas. I think, you know, obviously if you're writing a pilot app, then you do need to be thinking a little bit about the series as a whole and, you know, with a play, it's all contained into one moment. And then it's that kind of, and I found that really terrifying that, that concept of like having to try and come up with such a long plot and idea. But I think if you have the confidence to write like if you know what you're good at in theatre, like if you're a theatre writer who is good at dialogue or you, you, or you're good at writing something quite unusual, I think just find ways to bring that into that TV drama, like find ways to write funny dialogue into your script. And I think that's where I try and remind myself when I'm like stressing about TV is like, oh, well, what, what are the good, what's the good stuff? Like just focus on that and bring that back in. That's really interesting. Yeah. So, so keep to your strength as a writer, which will, which is in a way keeping to your voice and keeping to your yeah. Don't lose that in the in the kind of in the industry of it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think like sometimes you can get like you were saying about people writing how they think BBC want them to be writing, and I think it can be very like oh I need to write vigil, I need to write something as like, and then you're like well that's not very me, I don't have anything about submarines to be adding to conversation, but you might have something. You might have a funny version of like how would you write vigil i think that's like a, a better way of looking at it rather than like i should be writing like that, mm. that brilliant <laughs> yeah that's brilliant yeah, yeah yeah how would i t- how would i do it love that we've got a question in here for the for the writers from um, madeline gould who's asking if you could briefly talk us through your work patterns and routines if you don't mind um does anybody have a particular writing routine or a way that they approach their work that keeps them productive and mm, they're all thinking now it's all these all these faces hmm <laughs> <laughs> you're trying to decide which part makes sense because there's all this other like stuff you do before isn't it um amy <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, starts I mean, with the <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Um, I mean, from a practical point of view, um, I think if you've got a lot on, it really, it helps me to schedule things and to have almost like a timetable and be like, this is my aim for the end of this day. Like I'm talking really practically. Um, that helps me. But also I think it's really good to not get too stuck in that because there are some days where I'm just like, actually, I just need to go for a walk and that's going to be my writing for the day because I just need to think about this idea. Mm-hmm. Um so like with routines and stuff, I think it's kind of healthy not to get too fixed to one thing. That's what helps my brain. Um, yeah, but I think it changes from project to project. I mean, like if you're in a writer's room, your routine and the way you come, go about your work is gonna be totally different if you're working on a spec script. Yeah. So just find what works for you. And I mean, <laughs> truly, you know, when you read blogs and writers are like, I get up at 5 a.m. and do several hours of work, then go to the gym and then do another few hours. No, those people, they're lying. Those they're, people. Lying, <laughs> they're lying. They're yeah. lying. Those people, that's how they want to live. That's the sort of thing I'd say if somebody just asked me, I'd be like, yeah, I get up at five and I run a marathon. And <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, I did, think, I did think of one thing. Sorry, I'm not sure if I'm particularly answering the question very specifically, but also having a whiteboard and cork board on my wall to like actually plan everything out and work out what I'm doing and all my aims, that really helps. I think I'm a visual person in that way. Yeah, I think it's interesting what you're saying as well about taking the pressure off that like you can be you can be thinking about the idea 
and processing it and churning it over in your brain just by going for a walk you don't have to physically be in front of your computer writing every day that that is other elements to it like you're always sort of worrying at an idea aren't you in your brain mm. even when you're not really directly working on it I think yeah yeah George, George are you have yeah you some- I was just gonna say like a little bit does go a long way and to anyone who's you know in a full-time job that's not a writing related job or in a part-time job you know I was marching myself to like Manchester Central Library on my lunch break and doing 20 minutes and marching back and you know I might not even get a page out and I might just delete everything I've got in those 20 minutes and then come back but and then eventually I'd get to like a point where I was like hey I I know what the ending is I just need a bit of time to like just get it out and then I'd go sit in a cafe and just say to my partner like I'm not coming home until I've written the end of this script you know and I think sometimes I used to get into my head like oh I need four hours or I need like time to do this but actually that just wasn't sustainable for me like I wasn't in a position to be able to fit that in so just you know just even if you can put it into your day that you spend like 20 minutes on it every few days a week or something like that Mm -hmm. it it will eventually all those little chunks do come become a script like and just trusting in that process a bit it does all make sense and come to vent together eventually. Yes. <laughs> but also that's like that theory that it's like a muscle. The writing's like a muscle. So if you keep training that muscle, it'll it'll get stronger and you'll keep. But if you leave it, it'll it'll atrophy somehow, you know, and you, it'll take you longer to get back into it. So I think yeah. that's really good advice. Yeah. Just Can I just throw in something I just thought of as well that kind of goes off that, like when you just got to get it done and whatnot, like giving yourself deadlines, I think is really helpful, even mm-hmm. if you're working on a spec script. Uh, knowing that by next Friday you want to have a kind of first draft done yeah yeah um well we've got quite a few questions now so if you don't mind I'm gonna have a jump into these and um try and address some of them so Nick Fletcher is asking how do you create engaging characters does anybody have any any hints or tips for how they approach characters as as a group of um Theatre writers, do you just get them talking? Do you just throw them into dialogue with each other? A good bit of advice I was given was, um, it's for TV pilots, especially each, your leads maybe think which which really famous actor would want to play this role, what makes it interesting. You know, mm-hmm. Characters will be interesting if you put it on the page, but then from a from a salesperson's point of view, they kind of do say, but but would your favorite actor want to play this role? Is it is it meaty enough? Do they have enough layers of their ghost, whether their past trauma is or their background or their goals? Um, would they want to take on this project? So it's kind of thinking of it in that way. Yeah. Are you creating an attractive role for somebody to want to yeah. take on? Yeah. 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 I think that's a really good way to, to think about it. Um, yeah, some some advice I heard once was that um, we should care and also be curious about character, like right at the beginning of of a you know the very opening of a script. Uh, they should intrigue us from the from the get go, and we should want to know more about them. Yeah, creating ways to empathise immediately, and also maybe seeing them make mistakes or um, be mm. wrong about things. Or be stubborn or yeah. have an ego all these negative things that we, we might not think to put on our leads but i think those things give them this as an audience makes you want to yeah engage with them more and understand oh why are they like that why did that's that that's that killing eve opening scene in it when when she knocks the ice cream and you're like who, who does that <laughs> like and then you want to well no more yeah yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Where is she? yeah 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 Flawed human characters, yeah. Right, yeah. Morally mm. ambiguous, maybe. Even. Mm. Yeah. Um, we've got a question here about um, balancing writing with having uh, a day job or a, a side job or family commitments, caring commitments when you're at the start of your career. Have you guys experienced that? And how did you, anybody got any insights on how you went about managing it? Anybody going through it right now? Um. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I'll 
say like when I started uh, when I was on Northern Voices um, and I write at the start of Drama Room as well um, I was still working a part-time job um, either in largely in admin roles um, I don't have depend I don't have kids and um, so I was lucky in that sense that I didn't I, I could kind of come home and, and write if I needed to but I did I was just very busy with lots of <laughs> different things so definitely there was a juggling act to happen and I think um like I said about like finding little spaces was a big thing for me and mm. also if it's possible to talk to your employer um and be honest I don't know it depends employer to employer and I know that I'm I had different employees who had different opinions on the writing but yeah I had some really great help as well and they knew you know they were like they would sort of say oh you know is there any way we can make this like work for you a little bit like if if it's possible to get any flexibility and things like that if you know there's a certain time that's better for you to write if there's you know that there's see if there's any and, and I know that's not possible for everyone I don't want to like make out that that's that's something you can do but when I was a TA like I knew if I got home um I would not write because <laughs> I would just get into bed um but so I would say like okay I've got to find somewhere that I will write between home and the school like I've got to find a cafe I've got to find a library I've got to find somewhere that I walk myself to um mm-hmm. that I'm not just going home and doing the laundry and going to sleep if that makes sense yeah no that makes a lot of sense it's changing your setting can sometimes change your mindset can't it like your physical space yeah that's really helpful advice thank you um we've got another question here about um how long had each of you been writing before you were selected for um your first writer's room group can you remember yeah roughly like took a while i uh I was submitting back when uh, you print the script off, Patrice will tell you, you print the script off and post it in physically. Mm-hmm. Um, and I submitted every year, so it took about seven, eight years. But I blame myself for that. Like, I, I think I was still, it took a while for me to find my voice, I think, you know, um, and get noticed. And then, you know, then there's steps, isn't it? So then I got closer and closer with every mm-hmm. new submission. Amy, Georgia, do you, do you remember? How long had you been scribbling? Um, I, I was a bit annoyed. So I, so I wrote, I'd kind of been writing various different things, but not really taking it too seriously, just doing it. Yeah. Uh, and like essays and whatnot. And then I wrote my first play late 2019. And I think I applied in January 2020 and got on. So I was incredibly, incredibly lucky. Um, and yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah. Georgia? Yeah, I think I wrote my first full play as part of uni in 2016 and I got onto Northern Voices, I think, in 2019. So it was about three years of kind of writing plays and sending them in and that that kind of thing. Yeah. 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 It all you, takes time, doesn't it? Were you studying drama, Georgia? Yeah, music and drama joint. Yeah. Mm. So reading lots of scripts as well, presumably, as part of that. Yeah. That, yeah. yeah, and I didn't go in thinking I would write either. I came in desperately wanting to be an actor and um, and hated it as soon as I started acting. <laughs> and, and then was like, oh, this writing stuff is way nicer. <laughs> Suddenly a lot more attractive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, we've got a question here that's quite interesting about... Um, that your inner voice, and and I think it links into what we were saying about imposter syndrome as well. Any tips from the panel on how to ignore that annoying inner voice telling you this is rubbish before you've even finished a draft? Hmm. Does anybody, or does that still happen to everybody and you're still grappling with it? Yeah. Yeah, I I don't think that ever fully goes away, but I think the WhatsApp groups, uh, that's when they come to save the day. Because if you talk to any writer or creative in general at any stage of their career, um, they're all still going through it. And I was talking about it the other day, I can't remember what, but um, like I listen to a lot of podcasts and memoirs and things like that of um, writers, comedians, actors and everything. And it quietens the voice to know that the voice exists in other people's minds mm. um, in a weird way. 
So I, yeah, that's what I do. Yeah. Yeah, I feel it never goes, but uh, I think at some point I realized I need, there's there's like the the voice telling you it's not good, no one's gonna like it. But then you know you wrote it, so you like it somewhat. Mm. And it's it I always I always am like, do I love this? Do I like it? Most of the time I do. And um the, the voice saying they won't like it is saying, you know. The execs aren't gonna like it, your agent's not gonna like it, Amy's not gonna like it, who you mm. it's not for Nigel. But that that you, you gotta let that voice say all that stuff and then just say back to it. But I think it's really good, you know. I, yeah, I believe so. in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I like it's this I, I think it's sick, you know. <laughs> you you gotta like approach it like it's like a show you've watched that you love and you know mm. no one else loves it, but you don't care that no one else loves it because you still love that show, regardless of who likes it or doesn't and if they don't like it you're like well you've got bad taste that's that's how you have to like see it yeah but that takes a while I think to get to that point and yeah. that voice sometimes I think is trying to protect you as well isn't it definitely it's trying to, say, yeah, it's yeah, trying yeah. to keep you safe yeah. so you don't yeah, sort yeah. of expose yourself and make yourself vulnerable sometimes I think as well yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah I don't know it's where like I heard this primitive there's an actual painful response in your brain when you're critique on your work like mm. there's an actual connection between between uh something about like you know you've created a project same way you might create children if your child is criticized the same way your script is criicized it's the same sort of pain apparently i don't know where i heard this it sounds a bit I no, it's a script podcast i'm sure i heard it somewhere it's probably like that john august one but um Makes sense. So yeah, it's very painful to be critiqued and to be like analyzed. So that voice is, I think, also a self-preservation thing. Yeah, definitely. Can I get one top tip from each of you about for writers who are um, thinking of submitting this year? Sorry, Amy, I'm going to start with you again. I think we've already touched on it a lot, but just don't try and be someone else. Um, just write what you want to write. Don't overthink it. That's what this opportunity is all about. And also, yeah, it's that classic thing of people saying, don't send in the first draft, you know, work on it and be proud of it. Um, mm. It feel like Dan was just saying about how, how he feels like, yeah, this is, this is great. That's how you need to feel when you press send on that application. Great. Nigel. I've covered most of them, I think, but um, I would say submit the script that represents you as a writer, not the script you think will do you best. Not your necessarily your best script. Do the one that really represents you and your take on the world and your experience and why you're writing it. And that will shine through. That honesty. Right. That and vulnerability, actually, that we've been touching on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Daniel. Yeah, I think I think we've touched on all. You know, we've been talking a long time uh, now. We've covered. Yeah, a lot yeah, now. yeah. I, I, yeah, I think I think it's like, is the idea um, something that really lights something in you? You know, is it something that excites you, bothers you, scares you? Yeah. Um, and you will probably get noticed for that reason. And yeah, don't do the first draft. Submit. Um, and then and then let it go, you know, and then and then write some more scripts, write some more ideas, uh, yeah. make some more contacts, read some of your other stuff. Continue the the submission is part of your career of the year, you know. So you can look back on a year and say, I've done this, I've written these scripts, I've submitted to this year to the writers' room. Just remember that your progression as a writer includes your chapter on the writers' room. You know, it's not the be or an end all day. Yeah, very good. Very good. Georgia, sorry, you're, you're, we've spoken so much now. It's, it's a bit of pressure now to say something original, but. <laughs> yeah, I won't <laughs> say anything original. Um, uh, just um, don't send in your first draft, but do send it in, is what I would say. I did not feel like my script was ready, but because I, it will never feel perfect. But if you've had a few bit, you know, if you've sent it to your mates, if you're feeling good about it, if you think there's something in there, I just would say, give it a shot. What's the worst that's going to happen? Just send it in. Yeah. Sorry, can I also say, you? I think we, you don't realise how interesting you all are as well, I think. So mm. you could write about 
something as trivial. I worked in bars for like most of my 20s. And that's actually quite a unique point of view working in bars, you know, stuff like that. Or I did, I worked, I, you know, you've done jobs, right? You know, it doesn't even have to be jobs. It could be where you're from, your upbringing, mm-hmm. your family. There's, there's always some sort of, it doesn't have to be an experience, but there is actually some experience there that you've had or are connected to that's incredibly unique and a great place to also start. Yeah. That's what made Responder so good, wasn't it? Didn't the writer come from that as a career, you know? Yeah. yeah. Over here, yeah, I think we really like that. Yeah. Those and are... this is going to hurt, I was going to say as well, that came from absolute direct personal experience. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it doesn't yeah. have to be like one of those those high-octane places. It can be as simple as, oh, you know what, my first job was like cleaning up hair in a hairdresser's. But that's, that's actually, that's, yeah, I'm sure you've got some interesting stories there, you know, and it could be a fun one hour or a half hour. Yeah. So embrace your like uniqueness. Yeah, I love that. You're more interesting than you think you are. Yeah. Yeah, I love that too. Yeah. That's great. I'm gonna write that down. <laughs> Brill, well, thank you so much, everyone. We're at time now. We're over time. So thank you to the brilliant panelists for joining us over their lunchtime and giving so many brilliant, generous insights. Really, really appreciate it. Thanks to the audience today as well for all the brilliant questions. Uh Patrice has been like typing away furiously answering as many of them as he can and we've only been able to uh, touch on a few of them here actually in conversation but thank you for those um i want to take this opportunity to wish everybody loads and loads of luck submitting um we're looking forward to reading your scripts and i hope to meet some of you at one of our drop-in sessions in the coming weeks so have a great rest of the day and a very happy halloween and thank you bye bye everybody